Good morning. Let's stand together and let's sing.
because he is our father.
Well, good morning. It's so good to see all of you here today. Guests, we're particularly glad that you've joined us today. Maybe it's your first time here with us, or maybe you've been coming for a while, but we want to get connected with you. Guests, we really do want to help you take your next steps in following Jesus. And maybe that is right here at First Baptist Richardson. As you came in the door today, you may have received a bulletin. At the bottom of that bulletin is a little tear-off. You can tear off that little uh, part and put that in the offering plate with your information so we can, uh, we can connect with you this week. Also, for all of us, there's a place for prayer requests. Please put that in the offering plate as well. We meet every Tuesday morning for prayer and other times during the week to lift up those requests. We have a special guest with us in worship today. Warren Samuels will be bringing the message for us today. Warren uh, has spoken to our church before. It was a few years ago when Randy Johnson was youth minister. Warren actually preached one of our youth camps. We're glad to have Warren here. He is now the leader of Hope to Hollywood. It's an organization that brings the Word of God to young adults in the entertainment industry. Warren, we're so glad to have y'all with us today. Now, let's take a look at the screens. Good morning. It's great to worship all together today. I'm Rhonda Bristow, and I would love to tell you about some things that are going on. We have three exciting mission trips planned for 2024. For spring break, we're doing two sets of Backyard Bible Clubs right here in Richardson. Bring your family to show love to our neighbors. In June, we'll be going back to the Valley to continue our work there, reaching the immigrants who live in the Rio Grande Valley. This is a great family and individual trip for all ages. Then we will head to New York City in the fall. We will work with organizations that serve the homeless, help with the food pantry, and conduct prayer stations. Join us in Fellowship Hall at noon to learn more about all of these opportunities. Today is also the beginning of nativity rehearsals for carols. We need you. Help us to fill this stage to present the story of Jesus. We will be meeting right here at four o'clock this afternoon. Finally, we will have the new Well Journals available next Sunday. This is our fourth year of reading and studying the Bible together using the well. Some of you use it for your personal quiet time. Several Sunday morning groups spend part of their class studying together. It's used as a tool for mentorship for others. Personally, I've been using it in my D group and it's been great. Go ahead and reserve your copy now by texting WELL to 972-235-5296 or go to the events tab in the church team's app. Well, that's it for today. Have a great week. Hey, church family, this Let's is Ron. Let's prepare our hearts to give. We give of our time, our talents, our treasures. Let's dedicate them to the Lord now. God, we thank you for the way you've blessed us so richly. We thank you how you've given us your word that we can know you. You've given us your Holy Spirit to live in us. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit among us. Lord, use this time today as we give our thanks to you and we dedicate our lives to you. Lord, we thank you. Use us as we leave this place to be your representatives, your ambassadors in a world that is dark and needing the hope of Jesus. And we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Let's sing together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds. Thank you. 
Amen. Lord, we thank you that we don't fight on our own, that you fight for us. Lord, forgive us of taking up boxing gloves and try to do it ourselves. Lord, help us to depend on you. Lord, in a world that is in need of hope, and oftentimes in our own lives, we are in need of hope. Oh, be very real to us. Show us yourself, and we'll give you praise that our life is in your hands. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.
And that was awesome. Thank you, Andy, so much, choir and orchestra. We just want to welcome those of you who are uh, with us this morning, joining us from Worship East, and so glad to see each and every one of you. I've not been here in 30 years. <laughs> this place looks a little different. Have y'all noticed that? But I tell you what, some of the people here that I have loved for a long time, i.e. Randy Johnson, has not changed. In fact, <laughs> let me just tell you this. Somebody asked me this morning, hey, have you seen Randy? I said, no, the question is, have you heard Randy? <laughs> right? Because you always hear Randy before you see Randy. But Randy, in all sincerity, you all my life have put a smile on my face, and I hope you never lose that. I'm not kidding. You brought a lot of joy to me, my friend. I love you very much. Glad to see you. Uh, my lovely bride of next week, 45 years. 45 years. Sherry Ann, just raise your hand. I know you don't like Stan, just right, yeah. Best thing other than Jesus ever happened to me. In fact, I told her, I said, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. I just want you to know. <laughs> We're going to stick this out to the end, and she is one of the greatest blessings of my life, and I am really honored. I can't even tell you when Andy called me uh, and asked me. It's a deep honor to be here today, Andy, and it's so good to see you again. Sure is. How many of you in this room have ever had the wind knocked out of you by a fist? Can I see your hand? All right, how many of you have ever knocked the wind out of someone with a fist? <laughs> Bill, it's, do you all have a counseling center here? This is an incredibly violent group. Do you know more of you in here have hit somebody than have been hit? How many of you have ever had the wind knocked out of your sails by an event? A lot of us. For those of you who have been hit by both a fist and an event, I think you would agree with me that an event can leave us as breathless as a fist. When my, young, my middle daughter was a year and a half, we took her to the hospital to hear the doctor say, I don't know if your daughter will live. That was a punch in the gut. It was an August Monday morning. My father called and said, your grandmother's been murdered. That was a punch in the gut. Seven years ago, I went to the doctor to have some tests run. The doctor says, well, you have leukemia. That was a punch in the gut. Would you agree with me that life has a way of being very discouraging? It really does. When I began ministry 45 years ago, I found an older gentleman who was retired pastor, had pastored for almost 60 years. And I asked him, I said, what do you know today that you wish you'd known in ministry when you started? He said, I wish I'd understood that the majority of my congregation at any given time is discouraged about something. He said, every time I write a note, every time I make a phone call, Every time I make a visit, I know there's a 70 to 75% chance that it's coming at a very good time. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the biggest tools in Satan's arsenal is discouragement. And I don't know why, but I, I think one of the reasons would be the fact that he knows exactly what discouragement can lead to. Discouragement can lead to depression. Depression can lead to despair. Despair can lead to death. And that doesn't mean that everyone who gets discouraged takes their life, but so many people who do, it begins down the path of discouragement and depression. And so this morning, I thought we would explore the subject dealing with discouragement. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to the 19th chapter of the book of First Kings. Now, let me just say by way of background, First uh, Kings 18, my very personal favorite chapter in all the Old Testament, it was Elijah, his confrontation with 850 pagan prophets. Prophets of Baal would call on the name of their God. Elijah would call on the name of his God and the God that would answer by fire. The people said, we admit he will be God. And you know the story, don't have time to go into it, but we all know that when Elijah prayed that the fire of God fell, 
And it burned up not only the offering, but it burned up the stones. It burned up the dirt. It licked up the water. Just like God, isn't it? God's always doing more than what his children ask him for. And it's after that event that we come to this event, chapter 19. How many of you in this room are are pretty aware of when you are the most susceptible to being discouraged? Do you know? Yeah. There's one of you. I'll, I'll just, you and I will just talk this morning. Nobody else gets that. But yes, most of us in this room, if you don't know, you better know. Because for me, when I'm the most susceptible to not only discouragement, to depression, and even sin, is right after seeing great movements of God in my life. Maybe it's a conference I spoke at. Maybe it's a mission trip I went on. Maybe it's fill in the blank. And it seems that the greater the outpouring of God's Spirit, when it's over, the greater the temptation to be discouraged and depressed. And so it shouldn't shock us that we find Elijah in the state that we find him in, in verses 1 through 3 of 1 Kings chapter 19. So you read silently as I read aloud. The Bible says, now Ahab... Ladies and gentlemen, Ahab was the most wicked, perverted king that Israel ever had. Those came from, the, came from the mouth of God. When God said, no one has done more to provoke me than Ahab, than all the other kings in Israel. How many of you have ever heard the experience behind every good man is usually a greater woman? You've heard that expression? That's not true in this case. Because the only individual more wicked, more perverted, more evil than Ahab was his wife. And so the Bible tells us that Ahab said to Jezebel, he told her all that Elijah had done, had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah and she said, may the gods do to me, and even more if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid, and he arose, and he ran for his life, and he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read these three verses, I could not think of any expression that would be better to illustrate those three verses than this saying, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. How many of you have heard that expression before? Most of us have. Well, I didn't know who said it. I wanted to give uh, credit to the author, so I Googled the phrase, and Google's response, a very insensitive man. Well, I don't know if the guy was insensitive, but I do know this. He was more afraid of one demonic, possessed, evil woman than he was over 850 pagan prophets. And the problem that Elijah got into is the same problem we get into when we face difficult situations. We put our eyes on the situation and we take our eyes off of God. He was more focused on Jezebel and what Jezebel had said than he was on what God had told him. Now, I want you to hold your place here because we're going to come back. But I want you to see something in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that if Elijah had had this revelation that the Apostle Paul is going to give us this morning, this story would have ended very differently. You do understand that Old Testament saints did not have the same revelation as the New Testament saints. God progressively revealed more of himself over time. Now, ladies and gentlemen, revelation has ceased When I have someone say to me, I have new revelation, that scares me because revelation is complete. Someone may have illumination. In other words, God illuminated their mind to revelation he's already given, but there is no such thing as any new revelation. But in the time period that the Bible was written, God began to reveal himself over time progressively. And so there's some things this morning that Paul wants us to understand that I pray is going to be life-changing. If you have this morning a pencil, a pen, an eyebrow pencil, something, I want you to use it. Because you may not need this today, but because you don't need it today doesn't mean you won't need it tomorrow. 
So you read silently as I read aloud what Paul had to say to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though the outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us the eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, we look at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now before we jump in, you have to understand something very important. There are two realms that exist in the universe today. There is a heavenly realm. There is an earthly realm. The governing principle in the heavenly realm is the principle of God's authority. Everything in the heavenly realm submits to the authority of God. The governing principle in the earthly realm where you and I live is the principle of Satan's rebellion. When Satan declared his independence against God, the Holy Trinity got together, found him guilty of treason. And they kicked him to earth, which is now his domain. Satan doesn't have a kingdom. You understand that. I hear people all the time talk about the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness. Satan does not have a kingdom. He has a domain. Paul said, Jesus has saved me from the domain of Satan. That's where you and I live out our lives, in that domain. When Jesus came the first time, it was to destroy the power of Satan, the power of sin and death. When Jesus comes back, it will be to destroy the works of Satan. Do you understand that? So right now, understand that there are two realms. In the heavenly realm which is the spiritual realm, things are going on that are not going on down here. So what I've done was I drew a line between the earthly realm and the heavenly realm because I think it makes it easy or easier for me to understand, okay? In the heavenly realm, things are invisible, things are supernatural, things are timeless. Below the line in the earthly realm, things are visible, They are natural. They are earthly. Time exists. You ever had a child say, Mommy, how can God just have always been? When's God's birthday? The only reason why a child asks that question is because they're living below the line where time exists. In the heavenly realm, ladies and gentlemen, time as we know it does not exist. You do get that. But if you go back to the text, you'll understand that what is going on here is is much different than there. For instance, below the line, our body is decaying. Paul cites that here. It seems like once I hit 30, everything I had just started falling apart. Anybody else in here relate to that? In fact, I was telling Randy Johnson this morning, if what I have doesn't hurt, then I know it doesn't work. And you understand? I mean, we are, we are just breaking apart. Everyone in this room is conscious of that. That's going on below the realm, below the line, in the earthly realm. But above the line, Paul says we're being strengthened. The inner man, the inner woman is being strengthened. Below the line, our trials are working against us. Above the line, our trials are working for us. Below the line, there's the losing of heart. The losing of heart. There's depression. How many of you fully understand that no one is being depressed today living in the heavenly realm? There is no depression in the heavenly realm. There's no despair in the heavenly realm. There's no discouragement in the heavenly realm. The only place these things exist is below the line in the earthly realm. Uh, Because above the line, all you have is pure delight. He goes on to say that below the realm, we experience momentary light affliction. Now, I know that some of you are thinking right now, well, hey, getting diagnosed with cancer is not light affliction, Warren. Having a spouse leave you for someone else is not light affliction. I lost my baby, Warren. 
That's not light affliction. My spouse walked in one day and told me they don't love me anymore. That wasn't light affliction. And I get it. Except when you contrast it and you put it up against what awaits us, which is the eternal weight of God's glory. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul seems to imply here that we'll never experience the eternal weight of glory without walking down the pathway of affliction. Have you ever stopped to think about how egotistical we would be? What egomaniacs we would be without suffering? You stop, you think about it. You don't like suffering? I don't like suffering. But many of you could attest to the fact today that you are different because God allowed you to walk down some path of affliction because affliction does something to us that nothing else in life does. It purges us, it purifies us, it molds us, it makes us, it breaks us into the image of our Redeemer. The eternal weight of glory is that glory that God has yet to reveal to us. And yet, even on earth, God allows us to experience that joy. You understand, folks, there is no joy found below the line. Have y'all figured that out by now? If you're looking for joy below the line, you'll never find it. If you're looking for peace below the line, you'll never find it. It only exists in the heavenly realm. Everybody in this room, your pathway is different. Not everyone in this room right now is walking down the pathway of cancer, but I guarantee if I ask you to raise your hand, there's a bunch of you in here who have cancer. That's a path you're walking. That's your path of affliction. Some of you in this room have walked down the path of divorce. Some of you have walked down the path of losing a child. Our paths of affliction are different. But here's the one thing they all have in common. They lead to the same place, the eternal weight of glory that God is yet to reveal. Isn't that good news? It's good news. See, folks, the world suffers just like we do. Here's the difference. We have a purpose with ours. They have no purpose with theirs like we do. So he says that not only is there momentary light affliction, but also things are temporal. But above the line, he said, everything is eternal. So here is the key. I hope you'll jot this down. How many of you would agree that we have to live in our lives below the line? Do, you, do y'all just stare at preachers when they, when they say things? I mean, do y'all give any, do y'all let people do that? You'd like, like if they, you, you want some response or any, do they ever respond? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that question again. I've got all morning. How many of you understand that you're going to live out your life below the line? Go see your hand. Okay, thank you. That's, I, I just want to make sure we understand that. So here's the deal. Because you have to get that before you get this. If it's true that we have to function below the line, that doesn't mean you have to focus on what's going on below the line. Function, yes. Focus, no. No. In fact, and I, I didn't give this to, to the um, guys, but I, but I want to share it with you because I think it's so important. Paul said in, in Colossians 3, he said, set your mind on things above the line or below the line? Above. Not on the things which are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden in Jesus Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then also what will be revealed with him. Folks, understand this. We've got some glorious days ahead. This planet Earth is the closest thing to hell that we will ever know. But for our lost friends, it's the closest thing to heaven they will ever know. Stop and think about that just for a moment. So what Paul's telling us is that in the heavenly realm, I am dead in Christ and I'm hidden in Christ. 
Spiritual warfare is nothing more than the enemy attempting to disconnect you and disconnect me from the spiritual realm. He can't do it positionally. Paul's told us that in two different books. Positionally, I am in him. In fact, if you stop and think about it, above the line, I am in Christ. Below the line, Christ is in me. We function here, but this better not be our focus. Because if it is, we're going to live our lives in discouragement and in depression and despair. But I want you to understand, Elijah did not have this revelation. And because he didn't, he suffered some incredible consequences. And I want us to understand these are the exact same consequences you and I will suffer if we don't allow God to teach us this principle and to live in it victoriously. So go back to 1 Kings 19 just for a moment because the Bible says that then Elijah came to a cave and he lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing, Elijah? If you're taking notes, I hope you will, discouragement can cause us to run from our responsibilities. What were the responsibilities of Elijah? To stand and to speak, thus saith the Lord. Prophets were created to stand and speak, not sit and sulk and sour. And so the Bible tells us that he ran to the cave. It's okay to visit a cave. It's just not okay to live in one. It's okay to rent a cave. It's just not okay to buy one. But he did. It's exactly where he went. He forgot that God had created him for a purpose, just like he has created you for a purpose. You may not speak as clearly. You may not walk as fast. You may not walk at all. But as long as you're still breathing, God has a purpose for you. You understand that. People say, well, how do I know my ministry's up? Well, answer this question. Number one, is your heart still beating? Yes. Then proceed to the next question. Is my primary residence a cemetery? Well, if it's not, then he's not finished. You may have retired from work, but never the work of God. And Elijah didn't really understand that. He thought, his ministry was over. I'll never forget walking into my doctor's office and she says, hey, you've got, hey, I've got good news and bad news. I said, well, give me the bad news first. Because if I get the good news first, I can't enjoy the good news because I'm worried about the bad news. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I said, what's the bad news? She said, well, the bad news is you have leukemia, but she said, the good news is it's the best kind of leukemia you can have. Oh, yay. Wow. (laughs) Super exciting. Yeah. God, I'm, kidding. I'm totally grateful. This is all I've got. I'm saying it kind of tongue in cheek. But my first thought was, wow, well, maybe mine and Sherry's ministry is over. You know what God revealed over the next few weeks? Uh Uh-uh. It's not over. In fact, I'm I'm going to let you continue to do what I've asked you to do. But guess what? I'm going to give you some more ministry. And one of your ministries now is cancer land. Anybody in here think I wanted to sign up for that? Huh? Anybody want to sign up for Cancer Land Ministry? Nope. God said, and tomorrow is my sixth month. I have a six-month checkup tomorrow morning at 8.30. And I'm already asking God, God, bring somebody across my path that needs to know in that office how great you are. Because walking in there, it is a room full of people who you can tell have no hope. See, folks, don't you miss this. Sometimes in life you get to choose your ministries, but sometimes in life God chooses them for you. I would never have chosen this ministry. Just like some of you would not have chosen the ministry that you're involved in today. But God, I believe, has entrusted it to me. And instead of me sitting around whining and focusing on the things that I can't do, I choose to celebrate the things I can still do. I'm not running long distances anymore. I'm not biking long distances. I mean, obviously, you can look at me and tell, you must not be doing that. But this morning, this morning, 5 a.m., my dog and I get up every day to walk for an hour and a half. 
at least six days a week. It's my prayer time. It's a great time with my dog. I can sing any worship song. No one's around to be offended. I don't, whatever gift you got, Andy, I, I was in the wrong line. I didn't get any of that. So I've chosen. It's a choice to celebrate what I can still do and not whine about what I can't do. You understand that? Does that make sense? I hope that it makes sense. My wife and I have a ministry to millennials all in Hollywood. We travel to out there about once a month, minister to kids in the entertainment industry. Please pray for Hollywood. Now, I know how most of you probably feel about Hollywood. Whether you like it or not, it's one of the most influential places on the face of the earth. But since we've been going out there for 11 years, we've seen scores of young men and women who have given their lives to Jesus. Scores. Scores of them. And, in fact, we'll be out there in about three weeks for our Christmas party. But a few years ago, I had them over out in my daughter's backyard, and I was grilling hamburgers. And so there probably were 50, 60 kids in this backyard eating hamburgers. And so I cooked everybody a hamburger. And all of a sudden, everyone's eating, so I got a plate to fix me one. Well, by the time I was able to get my plate and to sit down, the only place in the backyard that had an open chair was in the back of the yard where all the smokers were. So my first thought was... um, I can't sit there. I'll get cancer. God said, you already got it. Go sit down. (laughs) The young lady sitting next to me, her brother was just diagnosed with leukemia. Make a long story short, about an hour and a half later, she gave her heart to Jesus. God will take something in your life that you cannot glory in to bring glory to himself if you'll let it, folks. So discouragement can cause us to run. Discouragement can also cause us to point fingers. In verse 10, he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altar. They've killed your prophets with the sword. Do you understand what he's doing here? He's putting the blame on his persecution on someone else. God, I, I, wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be persecuted. I wouldn't have stood out to Jezebel if everyone was living the godly life that I was living. But because I'm the only one living the righteous life, Jezebel singled me out. He threw a major pity party. There are two things about pity parties. Number one, no one ever shows up. Number two, they never have anything good to eat, but we throw them anyway, right? Right? Wah, 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 my dilemma is someone else's problem. I get so sick in our society today that everybody wants to put the blame of their problems on someone else. When's the last time you ever heard someone say, well, I screwed up. This is all on me. We want to blame everyone else for our dilemma. Pointed fingers. Some of us in this room, we're asking God to change our circumstances today. Guarantee you, someone in this room is going through something you don't like. If you wish your circumstances would change, and if you listen very closely, it may be that God says, I'm not, not going to change your circumstances. You know what I'm going to do? Ready for this? I'm going to use your circumstance to change you. Did you hear me? Don't ask God to change his circumstances. Ask God to let his circumstances be the agent that he uses to change you. There's one final one, and I'll sit down. Discouragement always, it also causes us to blow things out of proportion in verse 14. At the very end of verse 14, look at this line. He said, I alone am left. I'm the only one, God, who has not bowed a knee to Baal. I'm the only one who has not kissed his image. I'm it. 
But I guarantee you, we all do the same thing when we get discouraged. Oh, nobody likes me. Everybody's out to get me. I don't have any friends. Everybody's doing it. Wah, 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 wah. We blow things way out of proportion. But I want you to look what God said to him. Oh, this is worth the price of admission today. Guarantee you. He says in verse 18, God said, Elijah, I have 7,000 people in Israel who have not bowed a knee or kissed his image. You think you're the only one. You're not close to being the only one. I have people, 7,000 of them who have not submitted to the idolatry of Baal. Do you know what God is saying this morning? I believe it's not only what God is saying to Elijah, I think it's what God may be saying to some of you this morning. If you stop and you think about it. He's saying, Elijah, son, things are 7,000 times better than you think they are. You hear me? The only way you get to that point is to get your eyes off what's going on down here and focus them on God himself. Because God has promised, I will keep in perfect peace to those who continually watch CNN and Fox News. No. I will keep in perfect peace to those whose mind is fixed on me. Pray with me this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is as relevant today as it was when it was written thousands of years ago. Forgive us, O oh God, when our eyes are taken off of you or put on our circumstances. And it causes us to spiral sometimes out of control. And I pray today, oh God, that you would help us to understand that you are working everything together for good in our lives. To those of us who love you, to those of us who know you. And I pray that because of today, some of us would be drawn closer to you because I've asked this in Jesus' name. We've heard a message this morning that I think all of us can say touched our hearts at some point. And my question would be, are we functioning below the line, but we don't have a focus above the line? This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to the message, respond to God's calling on your life, whatever that may be. Everyone in here has experienced what Warren preached about. We have been in those discouraging times. We may be in those discouraging times now. We may be facing discouraging times ahead. But our hope is in Christ Jesus. If you're here this morning and you have a decision to make, maybe you just want to come to this altar and pray and lay that discouragement at God's feet and say, I cannot, I cannot do this on my own, God. I've got to have you. I need to focus more clearly on you. Just in just a minute, just feel free to get up where you are and come down here to the, to the altar and just pray. I will be here. Tracy will be here. Maybe you need to pray with us. Or maybe you're here this morning and you have that discouragement, but you have no hope because you don't have Jesus. Maybe you want to make that decision this morning to give your heart to God, to give your heart to Jesus. There's no better place. There's no better time. Maybe you're looking for a church home. 
I know no better place than First Baptist Church Richardson that you can invest your life and feel the presence of God and be surrounded by people who love you and love the Lord. Whatever your decision this morning, I pray that you would just get up without thinking twice because Satan will discourage you from making that decision. But don't be discouraged, be encouraged by the hope that we find in Christ. Stand with me. We'll be here at the front. discouragement to him don't carry that weight from this place oh, give give it to him at the end of this service so our pastors will be in the next steps room We'd love to visit with you. Maybe you have more questions. Maybe you want to make that decision today to join our church, to find out what your next step is to follow the Lord, to serve Him. Maybe it's baptism. What is your next step? We'd love to visit with you right out these doors to your right, to the next steps room. And as we leave here today, we leave to go and be his ambassadors, his disciples, his emissaries in this dark world. But as we focus on things above, we remember, we press on, as Paul said, for the prize that lays just ahead of us. So we end by saying we press on. 